my name is Steve Rosted. Um, I'm uh, the creator, maintainer of Ftrace, the tracing utility in the Linux kernel. That's why I gave this talk and um, have a lot more. But before I go, uh, obviously I have to do something and most of you know what it is. This is a camera. Uh, you take pictures with it. You can't make phone calls with it. But anyway, um, it's got to do my selfie. I'll look at that later and maybe I'll upload it. Hopefully I don't forget it. Anyway, um, hey, I put it up here so I don't forget it. Power off so the battery doesn't die. Okay, so next. What is Ftrace? I'm assuming most people here already know it, but I'm going to give it a quick lowdown. Uh, it's the official tracer of the Linux kernel. It was added in 2008, uh, 2627. Actually, I think the birthday of it is coming up or something. I have it actually in my calendar, the birthday of like Ftrace. Yeah, I'm, I'm vain like that. Anyway, um, it's Ftrace is actually really the function tracer. It's a misnomer to call it. Uh, really, the, it's the tracing infrastructure um, that people associate it to. Uh, I usually like that, call that TraceFS to be for the tracing infrastructure because Ftrace really is how to do function hooks like for live kernel patching. BPF does trampolines on it as well. So lots of things use the, the function hooks. That's really what Ftrace is. But I also, when we say Ftrace, since um, it was created with the rest of the tracing, it kind of like was put together. And Ftrace is kind of nicer to say than TraceFS or just tracing. The... Um, it was uh, the infrastructure was designed with embedded in mind. Uh, I come from the embedded um, world where I like app, I like to be able to do things with just BusyBox and not have to install other applications on top of it. So that's why in the TraceFS directory, which is in Sys kernel tracing, you could go there and do and most of the functionality of Ftrace is done by simply uh, echo and cat. So if you have Echo and Cat, you have most of the functionality of Ftrace or the tracing utility. Um, but that I've given so many talks about that. Uh, go find it elsewhere. Uh, kernelrecipes.org has lots of great videos. Uh, you know, several people here has given talks there, and I recommend going there. Whoops! You know what? Are you? Whoops! Oh, did I just hit? I just somehow hit this. There we go. So TraceFS, okay, the file system to interact with uh, the tracing system. You can enable and disable tracers from it. Uh, you can create dynamic events. You could actually say, hey, hook a K probe someplace. So if a trace event doesn't exist somewhere, you could actually echo in some commands, see my previous talks at Kernel Recipes and such, and Open Source Summit. Um, so uh, you could put in dynamic events. E probes is a way of, if you don't like, like if you want to uh, see more information on an event, so an E probe is an event probe, which means you can attach an event to an existing event. So something like the timer, the timer events, which has a pointer to the timer structure. If you know the index of the structure within that timer, if you open up GDB and you look at a field and that's not exposed by other fields within the uh, normal timer event, you could actually add an E probe and say, hey, take this timer instructor, dereference it, and give me the value here. And again, I talk about this in other talks. It's not for today. U probes is a way to put a probe onto user space and have it trigger and come right back to the user space. What well, it does it actually puts in a like a, a example, so it does a page fault or whatever and comes back into the user space and does it or breakpoint. And synthetic events is something I'm actually going to talk about today. And triggers you could do uh, you could set any event any of these events K probes E probes static events. Um, synthetic events, you could actually do stack traces, um, like make a snapshot of the buffer because there's like two buffers and you could do a snapshot to the other one. So um, disable tracing. So if there's a path that you know, you could hit something, you could put a filter that if it hits this path, hits this filter, disable tracing so that you can now, it will, that you don't lose the buffer. So when the, when the, uh, uh, the what's it called, when the uh, anomaly triggers, you can actually stop the tracer. So then you uh, later, like the next day, say if it's running all night, you wake up the next day, you see that triggered, you go, oh, and then you could you know, get the trace and it, goes, and it stopped right at the point where the bug happened. And triggers are how you create synthetic events. So I will get to that later. So this talk, yes, question. Oh, Jesus. I must say, that's what happened. Thank you. Better. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought something was looking weird. So, um, 
lib trace of s. So, lib, so I wrote a tool called tracecmd, which I'll talk about a little bit here, that interacts with the tracing infrastructure so you don't actually have to use busybox commands like cat and def. It makes things kind of easier to do. There's man pages, lots and lots of man pages on it. So, and there's even tab completion. So if you don't, like you do trace command start dash E tab tab, and it'll give you a list of all the events that you could add. So you only have to type, you know, a couple few letters, hit tab tab, and it'll finish the, the event name. So it's useful, it'll do the tracers and such like that. But what I really wanted was this functionality to be in other tools. I don't want everything to be in trace command. I want everything to be in, like, like if you have a tool and you want to access tracing, libtracefs is the way to interact with it. So it's a library to interact with tracefs. So anything that has to deal with tracefs goes into the libtracefs directory. Um, your applications should not need to know the details of libtracefs. So I try to abstract it out as much as possible. So when you say, I want to enable an event, you just say tracefs event enable, put the, the, the thing in there and it's enabled. Um, like I said, it abstracts much of the syntax. You could start, stop traces, start, stop events, you disable events, start events, start tracing. Um, it also can read the raw trace data. So I'm going to show all this and to get it out. And you can iterate over all the events, which I'll talk about later. And here's the GitHub um, thing. By the way, this, I Got the slides done an hour ahead of time. That's really a record for me. And so you don't really have to take pictures. You actually go into the SCED, go to this presentation. The slides are uploaded already. Wow, I'm really ahead of myself on this one. So <laughs> you can actually download and click on the link. So every so don't worry about this. You can just go to the slides and the information's there. Trace command. So applications, this application uses libtracefs. Actuality, libtracefs came from trace command. Trace command was written first. I started gutting it and then replaced and putting it into a library and taking and having lib uh, or libtrace or sorry trace command use the library. And so again, trace command is a, way, is a is a command line utility that you can start stop traces on the command line, read the trace ring buffer that's in the kernel. Um, and one thing it does is it records to a file. So you could do trace command record. You could do trace command start to just enables it, but you could do trace command record, which actually does uh, use a splice to copy the stuff right into the um, uh, trace.dat file. How many people know what splice is? System call splice. Okay, so for those that don't, I'm gonna tell you what it is real quick. It's a way to connect a pipe to a file descriptor. And what it does is to move data right through from one, from the uh, file descriptor to the pipe or the pipe to the file descriptor without going through user space. In other words, let's say you want to do copy and you want to copy from one file system to another file system. You know, the naive approach would just be read the file or read a portion of the file and write a portion of the file. But so what it does is the data is going to go from the kernel copied up into user space, then copied back to the kernel and then moved through to the whole thing. Splice, you can just say, hey, open up this descriptor, connect to a pipe, connect to another pipe, it has to use pipes, and then connect to the file descriptor and just say, read the file, write the file, and what it does is it moves the data just right in the kernel, right through, zero copy. So the way uh, the ring buffers are done, the ring buffers were actually written to be optimized for splice. So it does the same thing when you write to the file, like connect to ftrace or to the tracing infrastructure, it will do connect pipes. And all it does is say, move the data from the ring buffer into the file. User space actually never sees the data that goes through. Trace command can obviously read trace.dat so you could get the output from it. And there's tracecommand.org, which, by the way, if you go to tracecommand.org and you click on the pony, it will take you through to all the lib of, of um, other libraries. And if you click on there, you get the man pages. So lib trace command. The goal is basically to give all the features of trace command, the, or sorry, should I say, all our other applications, all the features of trace command. So I'm trying to gut trace command into a library. Um, so I'm taking as much implementation as possible and putting it into trace command. Ideally, my dream solution is that trace command, the trace MD application becomes a shell around the library. So the fact that all functionality will become possible for any other tool tools, but there's still a lot more to do. Um, currently it can only read trace that that files. I haven't I haven't got, gutted it to give libtrace command to write trace that that files. That's on my to-do list. 
Uh, like I said, it doesn't do it yet. Um, and you could use this for analyzing tracing, which is the point of this talk. So you can go to, uh, this is the, where trace command lives. Um, if you just do make and make install, you'll get trace command. But if you do make libs and sudo make install libs, you get lib trace command installed. So let's, this is just an application that I traced and I'll go real quick. Uh, when I wrote the push pull logic of the kernel real time scheduler, um, I noticed that uh, inside the kernel scheduler for real time tasks that there was no real good uh, migration. So what happens is if you woke up, if a real time task woke up on a CPU and was on the same CPU of a real time task that had a higher priority CPU and there was other CPUs available, it wouldn't, it wouldn't run. It would actually wait for the higher priority task to finish. Uh, so I actually wrote the code to implement a push-pull logic that spreads out the um, uh, task so they make sure that the if there's a CPU available for a real-time task that that real-time task can get to and not just be weighted on the queue. So to test this logic, I wrote this tool called Migrate. And what it does is it kicks off a bunch of uh, tasks. Usually it will double the CPUs. So, so like I think here I had six CPUs when I ran this on or something. So it created another, so I think it doubles it. So that's why there's 12 tasks and then it, of various priorities. And then it tells you, so the highest priority one is down at the bottom. It should have the least amount of migrations and it will actually record, run and give you that. That's great. Why is this part of the talk? Well, I needed to run, I needed to have an example of something I was going to trace. But I had to give you an idea of what this is for, why I do this, but I'm going to now use it trace. So right here, I did trace command record, which is the opposite. And I said, okay, um, I wanted to give it a different name. By default, it records to trace.dat, but if you want to record it someplace else, you use the dash O option. So you don't need it if you don't care about calling it. But I had other trace.dat files I didn't want to overwrite. So I said dash O, trace, wake, dot, dat, you know, dash E, sked waking, sked switch, you know, migrate. So. Let's take a little example. I just recorded. Now I took that trace.dat file and now I'm going to, I want to kind of do some analysis on it. So I wrote this code, this program, that this is the, uses the lib trace command. And you create a handle. So I always, I always call handle, that's for my own personal use. If you look at trace command, I always call the term handle, even though the structure is called trace command input. So you'll see struct trace command input with a handle. And then you go handle equals trace command file. So, so the file that I passed in is that trace dash wake dot dat. Uh, then you can pass in some flags because the flags will tell you if it should do some other external stuff for you. But that's, by the way, this is all has man pages. So I have man pages for all these functions I'm talking about. When I said going back to the website or that website, you could find the man pages for every one of these functions. So once you get a handle on the thing, you're going to say, okay, I want to see what some of these events do. So I'm going to say, I want to follow the sked waking event, and I want to follow the sked switch event. By the way, the sked and, uh, let's see if you can see here, this, this sked, sked, that's the system group. So if you actually went into the sys kernel tracing directory, events directory, you'll see a bunch of groups. You'll see a sked file, and then within sked, you'll see sked waking, sked switch. That's what it represents to. Um, so the thing is, that you could actually put null there. And actually, libtrace command will actually find, if it's null, it, just, it will search everything. So more for optimization you put in there, so it will only look at that one directory. But if you leave that null, it will actually search to see if it can find a sked switch or sked waking, or waking file. So if you notice that I have this callback waking and callback switch. So whenever the sked waking uh, event is hit, it's going to trigger a, this callback to sked waking. If when sked switch is hit, it will call sked, uh, this callback switch. Which brings me to, or then you could pass in data to this, so I could set up data. And right now, I'm just initializing the data to zero and then passing in a structure. So I'm handling a data structure to it. And then I'm saying, okay, go, let it rip. Trace command, iterate events. So what this does, it's actually going to read the trace at that file through all the events, triggering every time it hits one of these events, is going to trigger your callback. So this is what the callbacks look like. First, I created the, late, the, the date, my little data. I made this really simple. I just said, okay, I'm going to record all the times that the waking is hit and every time the switch is hit. By the way, when I first wrote this, it didn't compile because um, 
switch is a keyword in C, so you can't call it you can't call it switch. <laughs> so I, I call it you know I just took out the I. Um, so then you have the callback. You put the you know you have the handle. It will return the handle. It will return the event that the, so you actually get information from the event. It returns the raw record or the record, which is a, is a, uh, the representation of the uh, the data that was in the ring or inside the file for that event, and also pass the CPU that it was on and the data uh, you want. By the way, I don't I don't have this in my slides, but I'm going to make a quick point because I just realized this. Be careful about int CPU. I would not use the CPU unless you know what you're doing because the TEP record, I should have added the example in this, uh, the TEP record actually has the CPU for the event. Reason why I'm saying this is you can actually pass in, um, you can actually process multiple um, trace.dat files at the same time. There's another iterate, there's an iterate events multi. If you use that, it passes in several uh, things and it also handles, um, virtual machines. So if you use trace command agent, another talk, where you connect the host and the um, virtual machine, it's going to synchronize, uh, this will handle the synchronization between the two events as well. So you can actually see the events going back to that CPU parameter. When that, when you have multiple trace.dat files, the CPUs are going, it actually increases that. So if you have eight CPUs on one trace.dat file and two CPUs on the second one, that second one will be, it will be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight will actually, you'll get an eight for actually CPU, the CPU for um, the next one. So that's why it's, a, it's very careful. I probably shouldn't have done that, but I did. It actually uses it. So that's how you can differentiate things. So be careful about not using int CPU because it will normally work, but in multiple trace.dat files, it won't. So if you use record dash CPU or record, you know, offset, there's a CPU there. That's a, okay. Anyway, I just increment the things. Finally, at the end of my program, I just said, let's print out the data. And from here, I ran it, boom. So that program that I just showed you there produced this. Not really that useful, but it just gives you a demonstration of how easy this code is. So this is uh, something that's on GitHub. It's not on, and I don't have man pages for it because um, I'm still working on the API. I, I'm playing with this. It's hopefully coming in the future. I'm going to add this in just because it's something that's coming in the future, but I'm adding it anyway because it kind of gets kind of a little bit, uh, it's interesting. It's Tracy Val, which gives you ways of processing um, data without, it kind of does accounting for you that you don't have to do. So right here, I'm saying, okay, I want to have some, I want to have some information on a process ID. So I say, okay, I'm going to define a key that I'm going to start keeping track of. So I say PID info, Type is going to be a number, and the name is PID. So <clears throat> then I create a um, that alloc with one means it only has one key on it. I have like one, two, and n, so they're done slightly different anyway. But I do trace eval one alloc, and I pass in the and it gives me the or pass in the uh, PID info, and it gives me the um, um, uh, handler for this trace eval structure. Then back in like callback waking, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, sh okay, first of all, this is, side note, this is from libtrace event, which is stable. It's uh, part of the man pages and everything else here. This is all documented. It's in man pages. <clears throat> I want information from the event that went to the trace, um, the callback waking file. So I create, I know I want the PID from the sked waking um, event. So I say, okay, tep format field. Um, PID event. Everything's long, long, because whether it's that's the biggest of all values will be a long, long. So uh, yeah, I always have to put value equals long, long. Uh, if you notice, by the way, the PID format is a static variable. So the first time it hits here, it's going to be null. So I have to initialize it. So I go, okay, it's null. I'm going to initialize it. So I say PID format is uh, tep find field. Uh, pass the event that's passed in, I want the field for PID. So it will actually find the field for PID this, um, and then it will pass it in. This gives you information of the offset of where this is in the data structure so you could extract the PID from the record. Uh, also note, I, to fit in the slides, I stripped out all error checking. So um, I think I have, I, in, the, in the code the examples I have, which I'll show you the links at the end, they do have somewhat error checking, but I didn't fully put it in because I was kind of rushing it because I wrote all this 
like yesterday. So uh, I still have to clean them up and maybe put them up so it has better error checking. So if you're going to use it as examples, I'll ha hopefully have the actual code with the error checking that you should actually add because the all these things could fail and you should do something about it if it does. Anyway, uh, for example, if the PID no longer exists, it's going to fail. So anyway, uh, you get the, the format and then you say, read, I want to get the data from the record. So, so every time I got the event triggered, it says, here's the process ID that was woken up. Here's the process ID that's woken up. Here's the process ID that's woken up. So that's, I use that all the time. Back to the development stuff, which is the Tracy Val stuff. <clears throat> so Tracy Val here is okay. I'm going to, I have my key. That's a number of a type number. And now I'm going to say, okay, start. And what it does is again, you pass in a, the trace eval handle, you pass in uh, what you're going to be recording, uh, which is the PID info of type. And actually did I do this? Too? Oh yeah. I missed you. I missed a highlight. I forgot to highlight. I said the PID info, I actually put the PID. So this PID info has a type and a value. The value is here. I should have highlighted that. Sorry about that. I just realized I'm like, where's the value? So, so basically I'm injecting a key and a value into this kind of like it's the trace of L kind of database, which is it's, it has a hash table. So it hooks it up and I put in a timestamp. So here, start on the sketch switch side. I do everything again, but this time I'm asking for the next PID from sketch switch. So what a sketch switch is when a process leaves and when a process comes onto the CPU. So the next PID is a process going onto the CPU. So I said, give me that field for the PID and say trace event and stop and passing in the, the info there. <clears throat> what this does is matches when a PID starts and when a PID stops and it's going to do a, it's going to record the differences and keeps a history, well, kind of a history of it. At the end, I'm like, okay, give me the, at the end, and this is kind of ugly, and I'm, this is why I haven't published it. I don't like the interface, but I'm just kind of giving it you just up there. It's the GitHub's out there. This code does exist, so you could still use it, but it's, it's devel, don't depend on this code. It's not stable yet. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I said, okay, give me the number of results that it has, the number of, which is basically the number of PIDs. Now I iterate through, I'm going to find a, a key array, a key, and I'm going to say, okay, the PID. So I said, I don't really like this interface. It's, I don't know, I have to work on it. But then I, because I have to, first thing I have to do is I have to get the array of indexes of keys because this, it gives you the list of keys that more, if you have more than one key, you might want to, you have to do this. And then you say, okay, give me the key, which gives you the PID, you know, so you print out the PID. And then you, you can say, okay, now I, it gives you the count of the number of hits it has. It gives you the max. Uh, the min and it gives you um, uh, the total, so you could divide that with the count. I also plan on in incorporating uh, standard deviation as well into this. So at the end, you say, okay, now you run this code and it gives you every single process ID, what it woke up, what was the max uh, wake up latency, what was the min latency, and what was the average latency. So that those libraries do give you some information on what you could do very easily. So enough of that. That's 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 hopefully going to be um, advanced later. Anyway, back to synthetic events. Synthetic events connect two different events. So if you have event A, event B, it will connect them and create a third event. Um, and it could also measure the timestamp between those two events. And you could add the fields of either event into the third event. Unfortunately, it's extremely complex to create. But there's a tooling, in fact, my last talk at Kernel Recipes did this, and there's a thing called SQL Hiss, where actually you create synthetic events using an SQL line. But that's outside the scope. Watch the other talks. This is the syntax that we have for it. Very easy. This is uh, what happened when I found out that this has been in the kernel, I think, for like 10 years, and no one was using it because when I used it, I had to look up the documentation to use it. Now, I'm not the actual creator. I'm the maintainer. Tom Sanusi is the one that created this. But since the syntax is so bad that I have to look it up every single time to use it, who else is going to use it? So that's why I created SQL Hiss. I also created a library to create this too. By the way, once it's created, it gives you a nice little event in the synthetic event. And that's what the event looks like. So let's do it from lib trace of S. So, this is how you create 
the thing. So first thing I do is I tap, I say, give me all the local events. And then I'm going to call this function make event. Make event is not part of the library. It's part of the code I have. Here's the make event, which creates the synthetic event. So you do this. You say, okay, I'm going to create a handle. So you do tracefs synthetic alloc, and I'm going to give it the, okay, the first thing I have to do is I have to pass it in the, the tep handler, which is what has all the event information. The next thing is the name of the event I want. So I want the synthetic event be, to be called wake up lat. And then I'm going to attach, um, by the way, the first event and second event. Remember when I said that sked could be null? I threw in null in this case. So that really would have been sked, sked waking, sked, sked switch. I didn't feel like typing sked, so I just put null and let the um, uh, library do the work for me. So I said, the first event is sked waking, the second event is sked switch. Then I have to match the two, so I want the sked, it's the first event uh, field, so when the, wake, when the wake up wakes up a process ID, PID, uh, then when the sked switch happens, I want it to match the sked switch ID. So when these two match, then you get the trick. Now, the last one is if you want to save, since it's doing the match already and doing the work, you can make that part of the field of the synthetic event. Or you could just ignore it. If you want it as one of the fields, you give it a name. So that PID is a field of the match. If I put null in, it's it just says the match and throws it away. Then I also want the timestamp. So this is, I could say, synth uh, synthetic compare add a compare field, I say, I want, the first one is, what do you want to compare, or, or you have to put in the field of the first event, but there's a macro that you could use, which is called tracefs timestamp usex, which is, I want the timestamp of the first field, or of the first event, and I want to, um, the timestamp of the second event, and it's a compare field, which means it's going to actually do a subtraction between the two events, so to tell which way you want to go, I say trace of us delta end, which means it's going to do the, the end timestamp minus the start timestamp. If you put start, which will mean it will do the start minus end, but I, you, know, you want the, the second event subtract, timestamp of the second event subtracted from the timestamp of the first event. So you have to say t trace of us synthetic delta end. By the way, this is all in the man pages. And then I give it the name of the field that it's going to sh exist in the synthetic event. And then I return the handle. The synthetic event is not created yet. It just creates all this information in the handle. So the next thing I have to do is um, tracefs create or synthetic create. This actually creates the event in the operating system. So this is when you can do cat synthetic event. You see the event after this call. Since I did the tep local or what's a tracefs local events to create the tep, which reads all the events, it doesn't have the new event that I just created. So I have to tell it, I have to do and say, okay, fill local events is basically re telling the TEP or telling um, trace of S to update this TEP handler with the new event that it just found. So that I have to, if I leave that out, I can't do the next line, which is I want to follow this event. <laughs> so I just created it. If I don't do that fill local events, I do this, this is going to error out because the event, it will, it uses the TEP handler and the TEP handler won't have the synthetic event that you just created and you won't get um, a result. So if you leave this out, you won't, this will error out. So you have to do the fill event so it gets the information, which by the way, is kind of stupid because the TEP handler was used to create the synthetic event. It should have updated the TEP handler when it did that. One of the reasons why I didn't do that, I, I, I thought about doing that and not, not doing it is because it hasn't created the event yet. Remember that synthetic event create is when the event exists in the system. So if I were to have an update at the time it was created, it may give you false security. Like, you go, oh, I can enable this event. And it'll say, oh yeah, it's there. And then suddenly, but it's not there yet. So it's kind of like you create the descriptor of it, but then you have to create the event there. So I could probably, uh, maybe I should make a function when you do the synthetic create Trace of S synthetic create, I could probably do trace of S synthetic create update where you pass the tep in there and it'll do the create and update the event. So I might make that into like add another API to make the two this, do one thing. So then I'm going to do the follow the event, same thing with the callback. And then I said, okay, um, enable the event. So this is how you enable the event. Trace of S event enable null because um, I'm not dealing with instances right now. So instances are, are sub ring buffers. So if you don't want, if your application doesn't want to modify with other applications, you could create a unique um, 
uh, sub-buffer, and this is, it'll actually will create, enable the event within the sub-buffer. And that's where the null is. Right now I'm doing everything from the top level. This is a semi-tutorial, not a full tutorial, so I'm skipping over a lot. The synthetic event, um, wake up, I enable it, sleep, disable it. And then I do tracefs iterate raw events, which is similar to the, remember the trace command iterate events, which iterated over all the events in the trace.dev file. This iterates over all the events in the file system. So this, there's no file that was recorded. It was just the, uh, um, it reads the ring buffer directly. Then at the end, by the way, the destroy will remove the event from the system. And by the free is, you have to free up the descriptor. By the way, in my other slides, I deleted the freeze just because um, the safe space on the slide. So the callback handler. So the callback handler here is I used trace seek, which is the same, it's user space, it's defined by lib trace event, but the trace seek is also defined in the kernel, so they both up there. It's a way of passing strings, creating strings and passing strings. So you do a trace seek static, static. So it's null. The buffer is the buffer space that it's holding trace seek. So I check to see if the buffer's null. I probably should have put a wrapper in there or say empty or something, you know, or, or not allocated or something. I should have probably put a wrapper on that, but I didn't. So right now this will work. It, um, buffer, if the buffer's null, let's initialize it because it has to initialize, allocate the buffer. So it does allocate the buffer. And then um, for, for every time I come in here, I, don't, I want to reset it so it's clear, clear again because I don't want to keep appending to the same buffer because this is a temporary use for the callback. And then I do tep print event. This is a libtrace event call. And you pass in the tep handler, you pass in the trace seek, you pass in the record, you pass in a format, and then the format is kind of like printf format, but it has some special keys. It's in the man pages. And for this case, I'm like, just tep print info. If you have info. If you ever seen a uh, cat trace, if you ever cat um, the um, uh, trace file or did trace command report and everything at the end of the info, that's, that's uh, this thing. This is the info. And then I said, okay, print it out and done. So when I ran it, it gave me this. The funny part is I found out that the creation of the synthetic event um, is incompatible with libtrace event. So libtrace event actually complained about the, the parsing of the, uh, of the fields or something inside the, 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 the synthetic event. I left it in, so I have to fix this. It's kind of a bug, but because the funny part is it still gave me the data I want. It said fail the parse and then still gave me the data I want, which was the process ID and the, the next com and the delta. Oh. That's right. I, I removed the con. That's right. Ooh. Anyway, so moving forward, histograms, pre-allocated buckets in the kernel. They're fixed size. The fixed size a number of buckets of the kernel, but it's modifiable. You could create it. I think it's like 2,000. Uh, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, over 2,000 buckets are by default. I can't remember. My, my I'm tired. It's a long day. It's the power of two, I believe. <laughs> They're sparse buckets, so if they're not used, they're not like it's not like if you have you know if you use one bucket and way over here all the buckets in between are like wasted. No, it's actually sparse. So it's just when it says those are allocated, that's actually only if they have content in it. It's processed from within the kernel, which means it does not drop events. It will actually do it at the time it happens. But like I said, if you have too many entries, over 2,000 ent different buckets used, it'll start dropping events. And I'll let you know that. Histograms are actually what's used to create the synthetic events. The way the synthetic events actually work is you actually write some magic uh, into the first event. You write a histogram trigger in the first event, a histogram trigger in the second event, and you have the, if the keys match, it has some extra, extra magic to create the third, like to trigger another event. So that's how it does it. It creates, it puts it into one of the buckets and then puts stuff on the other buckets and then goes, searches the first buckets and say, oh, I found a match with these two guys with the keys. Now I'll trigger a command. There's several commands. Um, there's interesting, re you can read more about it in the documentation trace directory, but outside the scope of this talk. So let's create a histogram with libtracefs. So the way I did it was, you know, I the thing again, I did the make local events, make my event, trace, uh, cr create, fill local events. You already know that. Here's a little bit more information. Now I need to create accesses or keys for the histogram. So this histogram has only one key. So why are there two? Because the way, because it's dynamic, the way it's dynamic, it must end with a null. 
So that's why a, a null and a null key, um, a type of zero and key of null. So I only have one key, and my key is delta. And I'm going to say um, the type is. Um, hopefully, I will get not. It should work. Hist buckets. Um, and then I pass it in there, and then I um, I say sort by delta, and then uh, trace command histogram start. Once I do that, it actually ex executes the histogram. At the end, it puts it into a file called hist within the synthetic or within the event directory. So if I were to look at sys kernel tracing events, synthetic, wake up lat, slash, where you see the you know format, enable, all that stuff, there's a hist file there. So to read it, I just say, you know, traceFS event file read, you pass in the instance, which is null, because it's the top level. Synthetic, the, there's the, the sked group, or the, sorry, the, the trace event group that's in, which is synthetic. The trace event name, which is trace a wake up lat, and the file that you want to read within that directory, which is hist. So I get that into a buff, and then I print it. Again, I just, you have to destroy it, means that it removes it from the kernel. The, I destroy the synthetic, and then you have to free it. You should free the synthetic event too, but like I said, if I did that, I'd drop off the end of the slide. And this is what you get. So this actually is the code that ran. This is actually what I executed. It shows you the line that, the histogram line that did, but it did a wake up lat, and right here, it gave me, um, it's sorted by, uh, what's it called? Delta, so the lower down, so the, there was a latency. Uh, remember, it was microseconds, so 160 micro, or microseconds had one hit. And it was in a short, once asleep once. So this is, I don't know what woke up, but you got the histogram. So finally, the title of, the, of this talk from the, what's listed is about find out what you're blocked on. So we're finally getting to where most of you probably came here for. So what IO is taking the most time or lock contention in the kernel where something's blocked? Um, Maybe locked to contention in user space. Well, that's a little bit more difficult because that's a sleeping, it's not an uninterruptible block, but you could modify this code I'm going to show you to detect that as well. Um, by the way, I think you like this line, right? To come is S frames are to come. And I'm going to be using this for this too because I want to see where things are blocked. And it will, the S frames are, is a new feature by Indu over there. Uh, thank you very much, Hi, that she's um, created, which is the orc unwinder in user space. So we can actually have the kernel easily do stack unwinding of user space. So we're working on that. So this will include that soon too. And I'm really excited about that. So inside that make event function, um, <clears throat> I said, okay, let's, Let's do something a little different. Instead of creating that wake up latency, I'm going to create a new synthetic event based off of the sked switch is my first event and sked switch is my second event. The same event I'm using, sked switch, sked switch. Why is that? Well, I'm going to base it off of fields. So the first event is sked switch, the previous ID, which means that what's scheduling off the CPU. The second event is the next PID, is which what's scheduling on the CPU. So what I'm doing is I'm making a synthetic event that tells you how long the task was off the CPU. So I need a PID, whatever. Now I'm also going to do something a little bit, a little trick. Now, okay, here's the note. I, when I wrote this code, this, this, this feature came into 6.3. Uh, uh, Linux kernel 6.3. We're on 6.4 now. We're on the RCs of 6.4. 6.3 is the last thing to release from here. Um, I found a bug someplace else and I fixed it. And by fixing that bug, I disabled the feature. <laughs> I just noticed. So I had to actually now fix the fix to re-enable the feature here for this. So this actually, this only works on my laptop now. So give it a couple of weeks for this actually start to work because I want to get it upstream and everything else. So yeah, I found a bug, found the bug both in the trace of S code as well as I found the bug in the uh, uh, kernel. So this is broken, but it will work well, at least in a week or two. Anyway, so I'm going to say when on the start event, so add, Add a field based off of the start the start event. So that's the sked switch when it switches out. Do the ta stack trace. It's the kernel stack trace, not the user space stack trace. But we can also do user space stack trace as well. 
in the future. So, uh, it might be a little more difficult, but yeah. Anyway, the, <coughs> the it does the stack trace when it schedules out. So, uh, let me get my mind up again there. Yeah, so the thing about doing a stack trace on the schedule switch event, it only does the stack trace for the task that's scheduling out. So, that's the one I want. I don't want the stack trace of when I'm scheduling in. So I can't do the synthetic event. I can't do a synthetic event and do a stack trace off the synthetic event because if I did that, I get the, the synthetic event happens when the second event happens. So if I were to do the, the stack trace off of the synthetic event, it will give me the stack trace of the task that just scheduled out beforehand, not the one I want. I want the one, I want the task that's scheduling, the stack trace of the, ta the task that's scheduling in. So I must do the stack trace of it scheduling out. So that's why I say I'll start event to the stack trace. Uh, save the state, the previous state. So I want to know the state of that field as well. And down here, I'm going to add a um, filter because I only care about um, I only care about things that are um, <clears throat> scheduling out in the uninterruptible state, which I happen to know is two. I, if I cared about um, tasks that were scheduling out in the interrupt, interruptible state it would be one. If I wanted both, I would put three because if you notice the compare operation is this trace of S compare and. So it's doing, it's going to look at the previous state and and it with the two. Again, this is all in man pages. Going back to the main file, I've changed the axes from two to four because I'm, I'm now having three different keys I want to keep track of. I want to keep, I want the first key to be the um, state which is because when I first did this, I was doing both one and two, or I did the, I did it with three when I first wrote this, but then I found out that the ones were getting, was very not interesting, only the, the uninterruptable. So the interruptible state was as interesting as the uninterruptible state, although every so often you do see it going through Futex code, so you know those are user space locks, which is why I want the S-frames. And so I... The second one is I want the stack as part of the histogram. So the histogram is going to be part of the stack as well. So then I allocate it um, again with the axes. I'm going to sort by hit count this time because I want to see the, the highest number of hits that, you know, not the long, I could have done delta again too. Actually, I don't know if I did delta here. Shoot, I think I forgot to add delta. Whoop. And then I executed this new function I just added run, which is just a uh, exec, you know, I was like, okay, I want to actually record something. And then I print the histogram, which gives me this. So I get a histogram and actually I could add Delta in there with the timestamp. I don't, like, I forgot. Well, no, I did have Delta in here. I did have, a, did I have it in there for the log. Yeah. Okay. So I missed it. The very first one, which I, oh, I had a typo in there. No wonder. Ah. I'm missing key. I deleted it. I was trying to delete things to get the, the slide in there. And I actually uh, deleted actually one of the things that there right here. I was like, I'll say, what the heck? This is zero. The zero key is missing, which would have been the delta. And it's in the log. So it's a, it's a uh, binary logarithm log. So here, to, to the, the time it was blocked for in the uninterruptible state was 2 to the 17 nanoseconds. So it's not as big as you might think, but it's, it's, this is a nanoseconds. So it's 2 to the 17 nanoseconds. And here's the stack trace of where it was blocked, which was, it was a, what's it? Uh, downright common, and you chose the whole thing. It was an anonymous VMA root. So it was freeing of the page table. So it was an exit MM here. So you can actually see it was on a do exit that something was blocked for a long time, but it was exiting, so we really didn't care. And then the other one was another thing where it was another do exit. So basically, the, when the process is exit, I guess it gets blocked for a very, very long time. But I guess we really don't care. But you could see it. And by the way, I cut off. This is a full histogram. And it didn't it actually, um, believe it or not, I've yet to really overflow of the 2000s. Because you find out that a lot of times the histograms, they fit in the buckets that you want. Anyway, that's the uh, end of the talk. I have the links to all the code, all the samples I used are here in the slides. So if you download the slides, you got the links. Any questions? Or does everyone just want to go drink? Okay. Oh, like, you want to go grab <laughs> the mic there?
So uh, since, as you mentioned, you you want everything to work with like CAD and BusyBox and all that. Uh, like for the S frame stuff, what what are we doing about getting the symbols into the kernel for the stacks? Because just the numbers will not be that useful, right? You could get the symbols. It's going to be in the L file. So when the busy box runs, all the symbols are going to go with it. Uh, what's the question? So, like, for, for example, if you use the use uh, the stack trace trigger, yeah, you get a. So what what you get right now, from what I could see, is uh, you you get like a list of hex things. Oh oh oh! How are you going to get? So yes, yeah. The, so the stack trace. You mean because it's going to be hex? Now this is more for the. This will be later talks when we talk more about S frames. No, one, you weren't. No, you weren't at the MM when I talked about S frames. Were you? I, I was, but. I yeah. think you mentioned symbols on one of the yes, slides. Yes, so basically I... the idea for us frames is we're going to, we also have access to proc maps. Okay. So that we could actually take the address and get the file that it was for and the offset. So what go, what will be out in the trace output would be not a bunch of hex, it's going to be file offset, file offset, file offset. Okay, so all that code has to be written in the kernel to, to, to convert. And the... it's extremely simple. We got proc maps is written in the kernel. Right. Okay. It's just going to be using the same data. It's, it's the data is there. It's just it's just a print f or print k format or print f format uh, uh, thing. Just passing in here's the file name. Here's the offset with a little subtraction. Okay. All right. Yeah. Makes sense. Anything else? I'll pass over to Jose. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> I'm. I've been wondering how this uh, library that provides access to this trace file system, how you can use U probes with that right, as well, right? U probes? U probes, yeah. Probes yeah, uh, I actually haven't, I haven't uh, used anything to create U probes yet. I mean, you could do like the, actually you could do it in raw because there's a trace SS, that you could do, you know, tracefs file write and just write and pick the uh, dynamic events and just put the string in if you know the U probes. I don't have a U probe interface yet. We could add one. So yes, you could use U probes as well. Yeah, because I was thinking if this is becomes available as a library. It is library. library in, it, forms, this this yeah. is already in Debian and Fedora. I was thinking and Susie, I believe maybe this could be used as the base for uh, implement tracing in virtual machines. Um, yeah, we are, well, well, oh, you mean within the virtual machines itself? Right. You know, oh. that by letting the kernel doing it, so you don't slow down. We could. I mean, well, the tracing is done in the kernel, though. Yeah, it is, right? Right. Yeah, with yes. U probes, for example. Right? Well, U probes is actually, well, for you mean the U probe side of thing? U probe inserts like a, I guess, I don't know, a breakpoint. Yeah, or, it's uh, an yeah, instruction so, but that it's traps, still, yeah, But yeah. the thing is, the, it, the user space will slow down because of the breakpoint. That is so, um, so it, because a breakpoint is a kind of exp expensive because it does a full stack. So interrupts are a little, uh, yeah, yeah, little yeah. that because it records more data than needed. Yeah. Yeah, I implemented UPro for the Spark back okay. long ago. So the, what we're also working on is like um, uh, user, user events has made it into the kernel finally. Mm -hmm. So you can actually uh, write uh, basically the way user events works is you register with the kernel event that, and you say this is the data this is how the layout will be. And you say, to enable this um, event, here's the enable bit in my namespace. And it will be set to zero in the namespace. So in the code, and they have macros, they're working on macros for this. Though. So you say, like, kind of like a trace event thing, like you know, trace enable, or tra sorry, trace foo. And then uh, what will happen is that will have an if this variable, you know, do your trace. And that variable will be zero, big deal. And then what happens is in this will this trace event when it registers to the kernel shows up to in the uh, tracefs files directory, and then with an enable file, and you can echo one into that enable file. And what the kernel will do, since it registered where the enable bit was, it's going to set the bit that was registered to one. So now inside the user space, you'll say instead of if zero, it will be if one. And then it will keep running. And then it will do. Then it writes into the the kernel um, the tracing data. So how do you expect this library to be used? Uh, for which one? This, or this for one? user land tracing. 
for user land tracing, if, well, there's a lib side. To, so basically, it's this isn't this is just for mostly normal trace or kernel tracing. But for, yeah, yeah, but right. with lib side, uh, which is Matthew Denoy is working on this because that way you can actually hook it with LTTNG and other tracers that are user space. Perfetto is looking into it, uh, which is the Android and um, Chrome OS uh, tracer. So what the idea is, we'll have this library, but. Once the event is registered, if it's registered to the kernel, then you could do, you know, same thing with libtracefs or with tracefs is tracefs event enable user event bump and then enables the event. So you could use both libraries. So the one library will create the user space events. The um, this library would actually be able to enable it and disable it from from the application that wants to enable it. So the one the lib side is actually will be um, linked to the application with the trace events. And then you, whatever engine that you want to enable or disable the event would be using this library. Anything okay. else? So um, one of the, I think the one of the use case you mentioned since like um, you can trace um, on a particular thread when it's scheduled and then the next time scheduled you have the delta. Yeah. Um, so. Usually, if, let's say you're debugging a scheduler issue or something, and you noticed a thread has been, it's been not being able to run for quite yeah. some time, and you're suspecting that. So yeah. once you see that, I guess the next step is you you're gonna have to read into the timeline, look at so oh, what's actually running on that CPU. So right? there's a lot of other things. Like I said, this is short. I mean, I think we're probably over time by now, right? I mean, hello, my watch died. No, it's okay. I think we have, so we're about over time. My, but anyway, the, the, what I'm saying is you can also add triggers to the trace event. It's where you could say, um, you could add something. That if it, You could say filter if the delta is bigger than X. Stop the trace. One thing. Two, enable other events. So you'll see, th so when this delta happens, you'll see all the other events that happened before that. So when you're, you, so you could be tracing it, that's one of the things with synthetic events that actually I've used this is that I'll say, okay, when this delta is greater than X, stop the trace. And then, um, what's it called? I enable all these other events, a block events, everything else. And then when the trace stops, I'm like, oh, this interrupt went off that caused this huge delay and it missed a wake up or something. So I've actually I've actually used this to debug scheduling problems. So should there be uh, maybe it's our, it already exists, but should there be like a an application like doing the actual analyzing work, um, reading the entire fire and just getting up all the all the events showing there in, in a timeline, visualize it. Well, there's Kernel like Shark by the way that does that could do this, but also uh, starting Monday I have an intern whose job is specifically to write simple tools to do analysis of traces. So I, I'm hoping to get a, like, like the BCC tool set that they like, where they have all the tooling. We kind of want the same thing, but for F-trace. All right, thank you. And probably the last question will be here. Hi, so I was wondering uh, if I uh, remember correctly the the ring buffers are per CPU because you have to be fast. And sometimes you drop them, uh, drop events on just one CPU. But these uh, events, the synthetic that you shown, usually mean that something happens on one CPU, the first part, and the other on the other CPU. Yeah. So somewhere in there, you have to synchronize on the bucket or something. Oh wait, wait. So how oh, wait. how you large mean... an issue is that? Okay, the, the histograms are not part of the, F, of the ring buffer per se. The histograms are a separate unit. But the processing of the synthetic event has to work with the histogram buffer. You mean for the analysis, you mean the analysis tool, the trace.dev file analysis? No, no, the, the things that happen inside the kernel. And yeah, it happens at the moment that uh, it actually happens. So uh, like I said, when to connect to two events, it doesn't use the ring buffer. It actually has these histogram buckets. It's just a histogram bucket. So it's the one event has its own histogram buckets. So it puts it in there. It's not per CPU, it's per histogram bucket. And then when the other event takes off, it matches the uh, things, then it triggers the event. So yeah. So the, uh, my question was, if this causes some contention that becomes much more overhead. There's. Uh, um, it shouldn't. It's actually pretty fast, and I believe it's lockless because it can be even done in NMI context. Okay. Thanks. Yep. I think that's about it. So thank you very much, everyone.